Um, as you've heard, I'm an oncologist and a palliative care doctor. Mondays, that was my clinic day, caring for people with advanced melanoma, the deadly form of skin cancer. About five years ago, I met a woman named Janet who changed my life. You gotta imagine her, she's got this curly red hair and freckles across her nose and light Irish skin. She was an emergency room nurse. She always wore scrubs when she came to see me for her appointments. Janet has a special treasure that I'd like to share with you. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Back in the clinic, Janet and I together would try and figure out what treatments to use to treat and keep her melanoma at bay. She had reason to be worried her mother died of melanoma. She had a sister that I got to know. Janet was married, and she and her husband were trying to start a family, and in fact, she was on prenatal vitamins when I met her. We'd have all these conversations, healthcare professionals that loved our jobs. We both had sisters that we were always talking about. We had personal dreams and aspirations. And talking together, we would talk about the treatment cocktails, monitor her patterns of CT scans and symptoms over time to track progress. Janet said to me, Amy, I want you to take a piece of my tumor and put it away for safekeeping. Map out my family pedigree. I might need that family history over time. You know, I'm worried that this melanoma is a family problem. I'm going to put on my other hat now. A cancer researcher who thinks a lot about the symptoms that cancer patients face and how to reduce those symptoms both due to cancer as well as its treatments. The good news across all of healthcare, as you're going to be hearing about here at TED Med, is that our toolbox for treatments is expanding. It's very exciting. We've got more and more scientific discoveries that tell us about the details of illness, about our personal characteristics. The beauty of personalized medicine is within our grasp. But meanwhile, going back into the clinic, the irony is that the escalating amount of information makes it harder and harder each day to figure out how to match the right treatment to this particular patient at the right time. Fundamentally, as you've heard, we need more and more data, big data, to start to resolve these challenges and figure out, in the clinical space, how to take care of each other. Janet understood that. And in fact, while I was taking care of her, she wanted to enroll in a trial, a new melanoma treatment, and we enrolled her in that study. She went through all the paperwork, and each time she'd come in, she would get CT scans, PET scans, fill out all of her data, and basically enrolled and participated in this trial. One day, I get a phone call from the company who says, um, I'm sorry to tell you, but the trial is discontinued, stopped. All of Janet's participation needs to end now. I went and talked to Janet, and I said to her, you know, we've got this problem, the study is discontinued. And she said, well, let's go ahead and get my information, you know, all those forms I filled out and stuff, because I might need it for my own health care or for somebody else's care in the future. I called back up the company, I talked to them, and they said, I'm sorry, but we're the group who sponsored or paid for that study. We own the data. You can't have to take care of Janet. Her information was locked. In medicine, we talk about this concept of clinical pearls. You know them. They're the nuggets of wisdom, finely honed clinical experiences that we pass along, often from the elder to us as the medical student. But Janet, she passed along her own kind of wisdom, her pearls, and she did so differently, conversation style, girl to girl. She saw the value in contributing her information, her experience, and using her information often and well. It was the information herself that she wanted to teach me to use. This was her treasure, her gift, her pearls. So Janet reminded me, we're all pe people and patients. We're asked to repeat our stories over and over, doctor to doctor, within each different healthcare system. And meanwhile, as you've already heard here on the TED Med stage, that there's a national conversation going on about the need to amass healthcare data, to solve research and healthcare delivery problems by seeking through the data sets. And here's Janet as a patient, and she's asking me, shouldn't we, the patients, be the ones to drive the conversation? It seems to be happening around us and to us. 
but really shouldn't the information emanate from us and be directed by us? So through this, we started to reframe the concept of how information gets out there, and perhaps the concept of donating and contributing our information. Janet wanted to donate her information. She wanted to use it to sort out the hereditary causes of, causes of melanoma. And beyond her death, this is still her legacy. We give her data, her pearls, her treasure, a second life. Mm, donation. Can we imagine a mental model of donation that helps us guide an approach to health information donation? Let's look at blood donation. I choose to be a part of a blood drive. I choose when I go and where I go. I donate along with my friends or work colleagues. The forms and the process is simple, and I understand what to do. In fact, I get a sticker when it's over that says I donated, and I'm feeling pretty proud. The blood bank uses, makes great use of every component of my blood. It's precious and distributed equally and fairly. When I need blood, I can trust that there's going to be a system that comes to my rescue, a system that I and my healthcare providers understand. And when a lot of blood is needed, Katrina, a natural disaster, we know how to band together as a society and donate in mass. And when something about my health is discovered in my blood, or about your health in your blood, then there's a confidential phone call to talk about a virus or a blood disorder that you need to know about and connect you with a doctor. So voluntarily, we understand that there's a societal solution, perhaps the Red Cross, that supports the donation of a precious resource that we call blood for universal good. And in fact, we've learned how to do this in enormous quantities. We understand it. Let's go back to the clinic and talk to Janet. Janet's got a treasure, a new thing that she wants to donate, and this is the information about her health. But we need a mechanism, something that we all understand and can trust that allows us to aggregate our health information and carefully share it onwards. So what might information donation look like? Well, first, I think we need a technology, a method through which I can be the central steward of my information, and you can be the central steward of your information, and choose what to do with it, how and when. I'm imagining a website or an app, something simple enough that I can figure out. It's kind of like toggling my settings on Gmail or using my online banking website. I can get that. And it can be used from my computer, my iPad, my smartphone, perhaps via my doctor's office, or an organization that I can call. The second thing we need is to be thoughtful about the information that's collected. I would hope the information collected tells both halves of the healthcare story. There's the usual health data points, my clinic notes, my laboratory tests, my EKG, but also the unique information that only my story can tell, like how I'm feeling, how I'm experiencing things, what's meaningful to me. And it's collected in a way that can be aggregated and pooled across many patients. These are structured data. The third thing we need is donation options, a checklist. We need to be able to support a specific cause. So for example, I want to support Alzheimer's research, or Janet wants to support melanoma research. We can tick the box. And because I can make multiple copies, I can support multiple different causes and multiple research studies. But there's also the option that if I only want to use this information for me in my future or for my family, that that's an option too, and that's okay. Fourth, it needs to be trustworthy, and I need to be able to vote with my feet or perhaps my fingers. I need to know who is using my information. If I don't like it, I want to be able to immediately resend the right to use my data. Access to my information gets turned off if appropriate. Also, if I like what's going on, I want to increase access to my data, make more copies of it, send it around a little bit more. I can decide how anonymous I want to remain, and my health data is still available and aggregated. We're going to need informatics to work for us, metadata tags and new information mechanisms so that our information can be electronically flagged and followed. Five, accessibility. 
We're a part of society, and we know that we need supplemental solutions in order to support each other. We should make it easy for people unfamiliar with technology or not having access to be able to participate too. I kind of imagine info drives, or blood, like blood drives, or this idea of the infomobile, kind of like the blood mobile. Ways that we can, as a community, create energy and catalyze around each other. And finally, feedback. Track my personal health statistics over time, like you heard Deborah telling you about, or Larry's description of what he understood from his own data. How am I contributing to the future? What research is happening because of my information? Let me know. And I really like those stickers. Put a badge on my website or say something else that tells me I've donated and allows me to announce that to the world. I want to be proud. So what might be the result of a system? A carefully constructed, transparent approach with patients at the starting point, information emanating from us. My same pieces of information can be copied and replicated and pasted and reused for multiple purposes. It doesn't make me answer the same questions twice. My donated information can become a part of a shared, pooled center or resource for learning and research. And by designating Alzheimer's or melanoma research, it accelerates my connection to meaning and reinforces the impetus to donate. This isn't just volunteerism, either. It also supports my own health. You've heard that already, the idea that information can directly benefit me, available when I need it. A snapshot of my current healthy state, a baseline from which I can monitor. Also, it keeps a record of my whole story, not just a medicalized me, but things that matter to me. And in this way, it's risky not to donate. Finally, data is a non-depletable resource. Blood and money go away when you donate them and they're used. But data doesn't go away. There are more copies. And the more we make use of it, the more valuable it becomes. So Janet put her trust in me. She trusted me to use her information and her story wisely and to cradle her treasure. The devil's in the details. And when it comes to risk and trust, we need to make sure that we work hard together to get this right. But also, we have a risk of not getting it right. And our task is to work together. What can we concretely do? Well, first, we need the conversation. We need to give our data a second life. And we need a mechanism. We need to have partners to develop the technology together. And we need partners like you in this room to be partners in using it. I'm sure plenty of you have already thought about this idea or are thinking along these lines. And I think the TEDMED community is the place where we can start making these ideas move forward for us. And so with that, I say thank you. <laughs>